Hello, hello, welcome back to the Rot Gut Review. My name is Ed, and today I'm answering some more of your whiskey questions. And actually, I had to shoot more footage just answering even more questions because I keep getting great questions that I want to talk about. So, in this video, you're going to see my clothes change. I actually shot this video in two parts. Could I have worn the same clothes and maintained the illusion? Yeah. I just didn't. Also, just like last time, I got questions that I want to devote entire videos to. So, CAPTCHA had a question about glassware. JH had a question about getting into mid-level stuff, mid-level whiskeys. And I think both of those deserve their own videos. Much like previ the previous video where I had other things <laughs> that I'm gonna have to make videos for. You guys are giving me a lot of work to do, is what I'm saying, and I appreciate it. But enough of the intro, let's throw it over to Past Eddie, who's already in the process of answering some questions. I'll see you guys later in the video. Roberto Huitran, sorry if I mispronounced that, asks, how do you handle that whiskey hangover? What are the best cures? Thanks, Papa. Back to the Friars. <laughs> Shout out to the homeless cats. Well, uh, much like Grant Morrison's Batman used to say, the victory is in the preparation. So with hangovers, there's multiple different things that give you a hangover. Part of it is that you are withdrawing from alcohol. That's why some people drink hair of the dog, you know, just to get it down and get through the day. I wouldn't recommend that as a cure because um, it just leads to bad things. The other reason you're getting a hangover is because you did drink a bunch of poison and your liver is getting that all out of your system and your body feels terrible. That one, if you drink a lot, is a little bit unavoidable. But a third major reason is dehydration. That's where the preparation comes in. If you're drinking a lot of neat liquor, you are going to get dehydrated pretty quick. You're drinking a lot of concentrated liquor. It's a lot of alcohol in there and not much else. Drink water. Drink a glass of water between drinks. Always have that water back ready. Me, if I'm really, really drunk, I like to drink a big old glass of tonic water right before I go to bed. Now, if you don't get a lot of water in you and you get to the next morning and you're absolutely miserable, that's a little harder. My my personal thing, I like to get Gatorade. It's got salt, uh, sugars, and wa you know water. You know, get your electrolytes going. Um, a little bit of pickle juice, same thing. It's brine. It's got that salt in it. Don't just drink pickle juice though. You're gonna want a big glass of water with it because if you just have the pickle juice, you're just gonna dehydrate yourself more. Also, obviously, food. You gotta eat. You gotta eat before you drink. You gotta eat after you drink. You gotta eat the next morning. I know a lot of people like really greasy food, fries and bacon and stuff like that. And that's helpful. It's heavy. It sits in your stomach and it absorbs some of that alcohol so you're not just gonna get completely messed up. But, I mean, aside from that, I don't know if there's any, you know, real miracle cure that is going to get rid of your hangover. Drink juice, drink water, take some ibuprofen, and, uh, wait. Speaking of pickle juice, though, Akeem Farrow asks, Are picklebacks a legitimate way to drink whiskey? So, drinking your whiskey with a, you know, bit of pickle juice. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I mean, any way you want to drink whiskey is a legitimate way. You could drink it out of a boot with a pound of butter if you wanted to. Personally, I really like pickle juice, so that's good for me. Power Scissor asks, as an expert, hey there, future Eddie interrupting. I just wanted to say that uh, I don't like calling myself an expert. Honestly, I don't. I don't. It sounds so pretentious and snooty. I do not make any claims of mastery. I'm just, I'm just a big geek, right? Just a big whiskey nerd. Do you think there is a worse whiskey than Tiger Thick in the same price range? Yes. Oh, oh, absolutely. Um, Tiger Thick is child's play compared to Glen Breton Battle of the Glen. That stuff, 
uh, priced about the same, around $80. Although I believe it actually goes for even more now. But um, that stuff is gross. I I don't know why they released it. It's horrible. It's horrible. It 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 tastes like gym socks and rotten meat. It's awful. It's awful. Tiger Thick had a couple of issues, but it had some redeeming qualities. Fucking Battle of the Glen is just god awful. My Aunt Tracy is asking a question. Does Milwaukee or any other cities uh, just have a whiskey slash bourbon bar? And if not, why? Yeah, actually, uh, Whiskey Haze just opened up over here on the west side. Um, trying to think. Oh, uh, Doc Smokehouse, which I think is actually a chain, but they're downtown. They got a pretty good bourbon selection. Um, trying to think of what else. If, if future Eddie has any, he'll put them in now. Uh, there are also plenty of whiskey bars in other cities. I'm not familiar with them, um, but they're popping up all over because people love whiskey. It's the whiskey boom. Everybody wants to cash in. I know there's a chain called Seven Grand. They got a place in Austin and another one in LA. 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 Thank you. LA. That place is actually really nice. We went down there while we were down in Austin for the Bastards Ball. So, yeah, that was cool. Robert Smith asks, do you like rye whiskey? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I've only ever had Rittenhouse 100 and liked it. Oh, good. That's awesome. Are there better choices? Well, there's different choices. And actually, I've got a great video for you coming up next week the beginner rye video. So that's coming out next week. So stay tuned for that. But uh, off the top of my head, Old Forester rye. Everyone loves Old Forester rye. The, the base expression, everyone loves it. So give that a try. Contrarian Eggplant asks, what was the first whiskey made? I actually talked about this a little bit in my uh, Irish whiskey for beginners video. That's up there somewhere. Uh, so I'll give you the condensed version right now. So Gaelic monks traveling through Europe brought distillation back with them to Ireland and Scotland. As far as we can tell, the first whiskey was probably made in what is now modern day Ireland. And it was all malted barley, it was unaged, it was just distilled, fiery, white lightning, just super, super punchy. And at this point, there really weren't any rules about what whiskey was. It wasn't a commercial product yet. For the most part, people were using it for medicinal purposes. So people were just making this hot, crazy distillate, and they were putting things in it, you know, spices and herbs and whatever, and just to make it more palatable. So this was all happening probably around... 1000 AD or so, you know, we're not exactly sure if it could have happened earlier or maybe a little bit later. As for the whole argument of Scotland versus Ireland, who did it first? I mean, based on the available evidence, it is most likely that it took place in Ireland, modern Ireland first. However, what I always tell people is that Scotland and Ireland, as we know them, didn't exist. They didn't exist. They're just Gaelic people. At this time, the word Scots, the word Gaels, and the word Irish were all synonymous. This idea of the Scottish and Irish as separate ethnic groups didn't come around until much later. In fact, even in later medieval manuscripts, you find people referring to Highland Scots as Irish. So that whole debate is basically just us projecting our modern sensibilities onto this time period. All right, hello, future Ed, back again. Let's talk some more questions we got a little more recently. Giant Cheeto, great handle by the way, asks, uh, what is with the majority of people being total douches about aged whiskey being better? <sighs> All right, all right, I, 
Okay, so I try very hard not to yuck anybody's yum on this channel. I want everyone to enjoy whatever whiskey they like, whether you like whiskey that I like or not. So if you like super, super, super old whiskeys, I'm not gonna tell you not to drink them. I'm not gonna tell you that you're wrong. That's your choice, it's your palate, it's what you enjoy. That said, I do think there is a ridiculous fetishization of age statements. I think it's so dumb. Age statements are nice because they give you some information about the whiskey. However, instead of just being information, they have turned into this ridiculous, I don't know, symbol, totem, like there's some crazy mindset now where this, this number has taken on a magical significance to people. Age statements as a marketing tool became important back in the 80s during the time of what was called uh, the Great Whiskey Loch, which was basically when nobody could sell any whiskey. Bourbon was considered an alcoholics beverage. Nobody was drinking Irish. The Scotch were sitting on barrels and barrels and barrels of this stuff. And so Scottish producers decided, hey, I know how we're gonna move all this whiskey that we've been aging forever. We're gonna start putting all these age statements on there. We're gonna emphasize the age of it. We're gonna tell people how great it is to drink 20, 25, 30 year old whiskey. Cause we gotta move product. And again, there are people who really do like older whiskey. I do also think mm, there's a certain section of the population who took this idea of older whiskey as being better as some sort of golden, God-given law. And it's a little ridiculous at this point. Are you paying for an age statement or are you paying for good whiskey? That's the question I always ask. Because if you were to put those older whiskeys up against younger ones in a blind tasting, are they actually going to be as good as you think they are? I guess for a lot of people, Probably not. It's the same issue I have with allocated whiskey. At some point, it stops being about the quality of the whiskey and starts being about the perceived rarity and about the status symbol of it. It's, it's all about just the, the most superficial aspects of the whiskey. And I've run into people who say like, oh, non-age stated whiskey is just an excuse to sell us worse whiskey. No, no, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that at all. Because uh, really those age statements are not a guarantee of quality. They're a guarantee that that shit's older. That's all it is. That whiskey is older. If you like that taste, okay. But it is not a guarantee that it's gonna be good. It's a guarantee you're gonna pay more. And if you're a tech bro douchebag, it's a guarantee that you're never gonna shut the fuck up about how you only drink Balvenie 30 or whatever it is that you're so into. But for people who actually want to drink whiskey because it's good, that number is just one more piece of information to tell you about the whiskey. It's not a guarantee. It's not the only most important thing. It's just a number. It's just a little bit more information to tell you about the whiskey. I got a little animated on that question. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, but last question for this video. In the future, I may do more of these. These are kind of fun just to talk a variety of topics. But for now, this will be the last question. Andrew B asks, what whiskey would you serve your worst enemy? If I have to give someone a really, really terrible whiskey, um, well, that Glen Breton is actually right up there because that stuff was awful. But, but I also have this. So this is Wyoming whiskey. This is a single cask pick. And some of you may have had Wyoming whiskey and you may be like, wait, Wyoming whiskey is pretty good. You know, it's, it's tasty. I like Wyoming whiskey. I know, I know, but hold on. Prior to Wyoming whiskey hiring Nancy Fraley to come in and, you know, basically refit their whole operation, they were making this. This is awful. People have said it tastes like a if Jim Beam made turpentine, or if you cut mineral spirits with semen. So if I was going to give my worst enemy a whiskey, yeah, it'd probably be this one. <laughs> also, it just goes to show you how good Nancy Fraley is at her job, that she was able to take this 
and make it into a successful brand. She is a miracle worker. But that is all the time we have today for questions. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this content, why don't you hit the like button? Why don't you subscribe? Come on back. I'm making videos three times a week. You can come watch them and hang out with me on our Sunday live stream. But most importantly, until next time, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay rotten. Thank you.